Hello, hello, and welcome back to Bumblebee, everyone, where today we are setting off to ancient Rome to learn some of the top 10 terrifying ancient gladiator traditions. Let's start at the beginning, how gladiators got going. The notion of gladiators originated with the Etruscans, who preceded the Romans in central Italy. Traditionally, when an Etruscan leader died, as part of the funeral ceremony, a pair of warriors sometimes, you know, fought to the death with their bare hands to honor his warlike spirit. Normal stuff. But over time, this practice becomes institutional and the Romans subsequently imitate it in a more digestible way to them while simultaneously distancing themselves from the savagery of the Etruscans. Throughout the next 800 years of the Roman Republic, gladiator games remained infrequent on a small scale and only held as part of a funeral service for those of high rank. That practice began to change in the late Republic. Julius Caesar put on a gladiatorial show that featured 320 pairs of gladiators in honor of his father, who'd already been dead for 20 years. Seems like nobody important died recently and Julius really had a hankering for a gore show. From then on, the gladiator games thrown by him made the younger Caesar popular with the people of Rome. One notable exhibition took place in 216 BC when 22 fights were held over three days to mark the death of a prominent senator. From boohoo to yahoo, tradition to entertainment. In ancient Rome, it was tradition for the state to provide entertainment using two categories, lude, meaning theatrical performances, dances, and chariot races, and other creative pursuits. Then there's Monera, or spectacles such as wild animal shows, death sentences, and other unusual exhibitions. The Romans' concept of entertainment was that most of these events had a religious component, held on religious days, accompanied by prayers and sacrifices, a way of paying homage to the gods. As mentioned, gladiators started out as a weird funerary rite, and Julius segues them into the everyday by having a big melee, so now boom, they're suddenly part of Monera. There is scholarly debate if this is truly from public demand alone, or if the gladiatorial games being used as distractions that kept the people subdued so they were just hardcore promoted in the village. Some argued that the game reflected the typical Roman virtues such as courage, endurance, and martial skill, while others like Roman satirist Juvenal thought that the games preyed on the Roman unhealthy obsessions with bread and circuses, aka blood sport. In Rome, death sentences and ritual killings were a way of keeping the peace and showing the Romans who boss was. The arena was the next step, an advancement in societal distraction used to entertain the lower class citizens of Rome, but at the same time uniting them together in an uphold of societal rules. Think this is horrific? May I turn your attention to rugby, hockey, and basketball, three sports notorious for hardcore hits and the spilling of blood. Think of audience, rea audience reaction when a fight breaks out, when a tooth goes flying, when someone lands a dirty hit. Yeah, not so archaic, is it? Thank God, though, because it all came at the price of celebrity status. And yeah, it's still a price if your social rank remains that of a gutter rat. Your reminder that gladiators, no matter how esteemed, were lumped into the social ladder with working girls and heretics. Though often dismissed as uncivilized brutes by Roman historians and aristocracy, traditionally the gladiators won massive fame amongst the lower classes, so much that a name was coined for their ancient fangirl gaggles, Ludie, or training school girls, coined by Juvenal once again. Gladiator portraits graced the walls of many public places, children played with gladiator action figures made of clay, and the most successful of fighters even endorsed products like today's app. Many women wore jewelry glazed in their blood and mixed some of their sweat into some of their cosmetics. I'll dare any one of you guys watching to walk onto an NBA court and try and get some LeBron sweat for your next face mask. We know that gladiators were private citizens with a life sentence, people overwhelmed by debt, criminals, and occasionally free men attracted to the arena by promises of riches and honors. They never lost their community connections though when becoming a gladiator, and those who managed to make a killing at it, pun intended, have been documented to heavily give back to communities they came from, free enslaved individuals, and support the economy. One of the ways they could do that was brotherhoods. Because anyone who wasn't nobility had a pretty good sense as to what the Roman day to day was like, so they knew if everyone was already against them, their class, and had no intention to raise them above said stereotype, then howdy doody they'll just support their own lives and economies while the royal ladies fetishize them and the royal kids admire them. Yes, regularly they would be throwing down in life or death combat against one another, but gladiators viewed themselves as a kind of brotherhood, and often took it upon themselves to organize into collegia, with their own elected leaders and chosen protector deity from the wide pantheon of available gods. When a warrior fell in battle, these groups would ensure that their comrade received a proper funeral and grave inscription honoring his achievements in the arena. The same can be 
said for grievous injuries. Pooled union money could go towards a surgery or recovery or medicine of dire need. If the deceased had a wife or children, they would also see the family receive monetary compensation for their loss. This tradition protected their own, their community, and the fallen. And as you could guess, injuries and fatalities are pretty common in a battle of contrast. Gladiator battles had a lot of overlooked details and facets that don't bleed over into common conversation. You can have a whole conversation about what gladiators would wear while duking it out with his enemies without understanding why. It goes back to one word, tradition, shocking, seeing as it's literally in the name of the video. The Romans liked the battle of contrast, matching a heavily armed and armored man against a lightly equipped and more barren opponent. It's supposed to be like some Tom and Jerry, one big broody type throwing everything he can, including the monkey wrench, at the lighter, smaller man who runs in circles around him. I am essentially telling you that the Romans set up their death game similar to how we set up cartoons. Yeah, yeah I am. Big plot device came from all this blood sport lunacy. Chunky, slow moving. You sure you don't want some veggies there, Barley Boy? I'm just kidding. Also, gladiators are dead now, so I can't hurt their feelings. Besides, Barley Boy was a real title for the cranky tough guys. Researchers who studied 2,000 year old skeletal remains of 67 gladiators were able to test them for certain elements, including calcium and zinc. Using scientific method of isotopic analysis, they can reconstructed the diets of the gladiators and discovered that they ate a plant based, carb rich diet that included barley and beans, very little animal protein. They also drank calcium supplements made from charred plants. Unlike the modern day vegan who follows this kind of diet out of ethical motivations or being raised by the nothing tastes better than thin generation mom, gladiators evidently did it for pragmatic reasons. The diet was so curated and consistent that even with different dishes and spices, their diet was consistent enough to be called, you guess it, tradish. Love the puns. Gladiators fell into eating a lot of simple carbs to boost subcutaneous fat, which helped increase their survival chances in battle. Because of this fatty cushion, their blood vessels and nerves were better protected in fights. Whether or not they knew all the big sciencey words to explain it, I couldn't tell you, but they clearly picked up on it. That's what made this become such an indoctrinated diet for the gladiator. It was consistently proven to work, be efficient, and produce results. Besides, meat was for the rich anyway. Thankfully, gladiator medicine evolved after Greece fell to Rome, meaning it was time for some Greek training. The Roman gladiatorial games were a far cry from the Olympic and theatrical pursuits it enjoyed in ancient Greece, but the Greeks played an important role in preparing gladiators for their violent contests. After their incorporation into the Roman Empire, the ancient Greeks quickly carved out a little niche for themselves in a multitude of professions. Greek philosophers were employed to educate the sons of wealthy Roman aristocrats, merchants took advantage of the Pax Romana to sell their goods far and wide, and the chefs and bakers got to really blow some sandals off. For Greek athletes and physicians, Roman rule offered other opportunities. Gladiators, who required training and medical care, and the Greeks had the requisite skills to provide them. Their role might have been similar to that of a strength and conditioning coach employed to help modern athletes today. By this time, the ancient Greeks had spent centuries refining their strength and conditioning practices for the Olympics and other games. So the Greek trainers were perfect for this role. They understood kinesiology, diet, regime, all the things that gladiators had been lacking before them. The most comprehensive primary source on gladiator medical care comes from Galen, a Greek physician, surgeon, and philosopher who in 167 AD returned to his native city of Pergamon to work as a physician to the gladiators of the high priest of Asia. According to the historian of medicine, Vivian Nutton, only two gladiators died when Galen was operating in Pergamon, whereas 60 had been killed in the tenure of his predecessor. Galen's experience treating wounds and sometimes dying gladiators provided opportunities for medical discoveries. He disproved Aristotle's assertion that the heart was the seat of the reason by observing a, a dying gladiator who sustained mortal wounds to the heart remained lucid until death. And while having a robust body may save your life, a pretty face sells the case. There were several types of gladiators, the distinctions based on the type of weaponry and tactics, but the most beautiful gladiators were held in high esteem. When the opponents for a gladiator were chosen, their beauty was taken into account. Ugliness ruined the lustuous fascination with viciousness, while beauty simultaneously emphasized the pain of mortality. Real artsy fartsy these Romans. The Retarius, a gladiator fighting with equipment resembling that of a fisherman, was the least armed combatant in the arena. Armed with a trident, a dagger, a net, a Retarius wore nothing but a loincloth, a bell, and a minimal amount of armor. He was considered inferior to other gladiators, literally dubbed unnecessary to kill, and there was an aspect of homosexuality and effemacy to his appearance and role in battle. He was to represent the ardent love of soft masculine beauty in Roman Greece, placed in the plight of human disgust and sin. Thus, Retarius would stand out in battle but not be crucial to it. Since Retarius is not really high on the list of gladiator discussion piles, I'll leave you with satire 2 and 8, wherein writer Juvenal described Gracchus, a man who disgraced himself by becoming the male bridegroom to a horn player. Not the disgrace here, but Juvenal was a massive hater and everyone knows 
closet. A lot of sexist tirades. However, that marriage, like said, was not the embarrassing moment. It was when he fought by choice and effed up his one job as Retarius, which was to throw the net at the guy. He missed the throw like an effing idiot and was forced to run for his life. Even Grashi's opponent was ashamed to be fighting him. Here's a crazy one, name based off defeat. Hey, uh, to cut all the preamble and get right to it, they literally named all their categories of gladiator types after places they conquered. That's it, that's the show. Pack it up and good night, everyone. These gladiators would then fight with some Romanized versions of their traditional weapons and fighting styles and were sometimes also given a gladiatorial category due to being ethnic themselves, as it was a great way to show off how un Roman you were when chosen to be an opponent. In creating gladiators of this type to fight for them, the Romans tried to mark out those in the ring as different than them and more deserving of the humiliation of fighting for others' entertainment. So let's learn about a few categories. The people of Gaul, which had roughly covered modern France and Belgium, proved to be a formidable foe to Rome, as demonstrated when they plundered the city in 390 BCE. They're feared by the Romans until conquered by Julius Caesar, and then Gaul became deeply integrated into the empire and as being a wealthy province and provided many members to the Roman elite. So the gladiator was actually renamed the Marmillo to reflect the changing attitude later on. Another type of gladiator was called the Hopelmachus, and he was modeled off the Hopelite, the quintessential soldier of the Greek antiquity. They were equipped with a sword, a spear, and a round shield. The Romans encountered the Thraticans, who lived in the southeast Balkans between Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey, and to the Romans they were wild and savage, so they modeled that gladiator, the Thrax, as such, with a small rectangular shield, two leg greaves, a curved sim card, and a bunch of other weapons. Emperor Caligula was fond of appearing as a Thratican fighter. In his case, it's hard to know if he picked that type as an ethnic connotation or because they were just super cool and scary. And last but never least, who is surprised to hear that traditionally women got the short stick? Literally, they were given short sticks sometimes. Why? Even though we have a very limited history of female gladiators, it can tell us that they were hardcore B word brawls that put men to shame at first and transitioned into a spectacle more on par with two sorority girls jello wrestling in bikinis. Female gladiators are gladiatrix in modern language, while ancient texts referred to them as Ludia or Moliere's weren't as common as their male counterparts, but they did make their way into the ring. They were highly sexualized. Female gladiators only wore loincloths as opposed to the tunics men wore, and they were not given helmets, presumably to show off their faces and hairstyles. Fights featuring female gladiators represented the pinnacle of luxury and indulgence, often present at private parties held by the Roman elite. Unlike their male counterparts, who were often forced into the gladiator life, it's believed gladiatrix chose to fight for financial gain, honor, spite, or fame. Although evidence to support the historical existence isn't vast, it's compelling. Written and archaeological records have survived, including a marble relief and funerary items. One statue, believed to depict a female gladiator, features a bare chested woman holding a sika, associated with a type of gladiator known as the Thrax. Further substantiating the history of female gladiators is a law that barred free women from participating in the arena games if they were 20 years or younger. The creation of this law was seen as an inadvertent recognition of the fact that women had been participating already. Male gladiators, however, kept hacking away at each other for another two centuries before the last recorded gladiatorial contest occurred in 404 AD. The fight between these two women, the goddess Achilles and the queen of an Amazon warrior tribe, survives as an interesting example of a serious female contest. An ancient marble relief, now in the British Museum, naturally, shows that these two women fought well and respectively and were both granted their freedom at the end of it. All right, all right. Looks like you and I are both being granted our freedom now because this video is over. I show, I sure hope you enjoyed and be sure to like and subscribe and comment down below what areas of history we should expand more into. Maybe it's Inca warriors or samurais or underground assassins from India. Surprise me.